Thank you, Angie, and thank you, everybody, for dialing in. Um, this is a press briefing um, on a space weather event that's happening today here on Earth. If you have follow-up questions after this press briefing, please call our public affairs office at 301-427-9000. That's 301-427-9000. Today we're going to have brief remarks by three speakers with uh, NOAA's National Weather Service uh, at the Space Weather Prediction Center. First, we have Tom Berger. He's the director of the Space Weather Prediction Center, and he'll be uh, providing situational awareness and impacts. And then we have Bob, Bob Rutledge, who is the, lead, the forecast lead for the Space Weather Prediction Center. He'll be talking about the forecasting of the storm. And then we have Brent Gordon, the Space Weather Services branch chief at the Space Weather Prediction Center, and he'll be talking a little bit about um, the Aurora forecast. And with that, I will turn it over to Tom Berger. Thank you, Susan. Um, today we are experiencing, as Susan mentioned, a severe geomagnetic storm, which is a G4 storm on the NOAA geomagnetic storm scale that goes from 1 to 5. This is one of two severe geomagnetic storms that we've experienced during this current solar cycle. Uh, the storm commenced at approximately 1358, UT, or around 8 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 a, or, I'm sorry, 8 a.m. Mountain Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, the G4 levels have lasted for at least an hour. We are currently experiencing fluctuations in the level of the geomagnetic field and are not at the G4 threshold, but we are in the midst of a storm and that can change. Current impacts due to this severe geomagnetic storm include power fluctuations on the power grid, although we are receiving no reports of abnormalities or disconnects uh, on the grid at this time. We are also receiving reports of auroral sightings uh, spanning anywhere from Michigan over to Alaska. And at this time, we are not experiencing a radiation storm associated with this geomagnetic storm from the sun. Therefore, we are experiencing no satellite impacts at this time from this storm. This storm was caused uh, by two magnetic eruptions from the sun that occurred in quick succession back on March 15th, uh, UT time again, around 2 a.m. UT on the 15th. Uh, there were two eruptions from the sun. Space Weather Prediction Center models show that these two eruptions combined into one eruption, one sort of larger shock front traveling and intersecting the Earth's orbit uh, today. I'll let Bob Rutledge talk about the forecasting and the details of our predictions in a minute, but I can say that these two CMEs combined, apparently, at the Earth's orbit uh, and uh, contained a sustained southward magnetic field in the uh, resulting combination, which is the root cause of the geomagnetic storm that we're experiencing. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Bob Rutledge, who can tell you about the forecasting details of what we saw on the sun, what we forecast, and what actually happened. Bob? Okay, thank you very much, Tom. So in, in the business, just to walk through the quick sequence of events for, for everyone, and then we can pick it back up with clarifying questions at the end. So we do have one um, pretty decent region on the sun, NOAA active region 12297, 12,297. And uh, it's a moderately sized region with, with some complexity, so we have seen some solar flare activity from that region over the past seven to ten days. Um, that's kind of the first piece in the sequence of the events, the flash the, the, that is associated with the solar eruption. Uh, from those eruptions, we can also generate increases in the radiation environment around the Earth, um, and that can affect satellites, astronauts in orbits. For, in orbit, for example, uh, we have not seen substantial enhancements in that. We did have, with in associated with these eruptions, we did come a little bit off of what we would call our background levels are just kind of the quiet state conditions, uh, but we did not even pass our lowest event threshold on this. So really we've had some flare activity, and then we had these, these two eruptions that have now made their way, that 93 million mile trip from sun to earth, and are affecting the earth in the near earth environment now. So as Tom said, those were observed very early on the 15th. We rely heavily um, on our partners with uh, uh, NASA for uh, what we call coronagraph observations of these eruptions from the sun. Essentially, if you create an artificial eclipse or block out the bright portion of the sun, we can see the pieces of the out, outer atmosphere, the corona, 
that are, you know, explosively blown into space. So that's what we call them, coronal mass ejections. So we did observe and model the coronal mass ejections that were associated with, with uh, this activity, and we run those in a, a physics-based model that we run on our National Weather Service supercomputer. Uh, we call it the NLIL model. Uh, that is not an acronym, unfortunately. It is named after the Sumerian god of the wind. The gentleman who developed the model got to pick that. So we did run those in this NLIL model, and we predicted an arrival uh, late late today. So the eruptions um, from modeling that, and the movie is available on the front page of our, our SWIFTY website. Um, sometimes when the eruptions come straight at you, it's a little bit easier for us in our business. Uh, in this case, they were kind of not directed uh, right at Earth and kind of off to the side, so we were kind of on the very edge of this. So the question was really, do we see some of this, um, a little bit of it, or none at all? And that's why we, we live with a greater deal of uncertainty in these types of scenarios. So if we're off just a little bit on whether we'll just catch the edge of this or not, um, it, it can provide substantially different uh, results in the end. If you hear the term glancing blow uh, ever used in, in, in this business, that's essentially what that means, is you're just going to catch the edge of it. So we had predicted that. We, we uh, did have kind of the G1 uh, minor level geomagnetic storming predicted uh, for tomorrow starting late today um, in local time, and we did see the arrival about 14 or 15 hours earlier than expected. And as you've seen from the products and from this call, we have seen intensity that's a, a great deal stronger than, than originally anticipated. So how well do we, we do in general? So with that NLO model, we are usually plus or minus seven hours on those error bars, and so this one falls outside of that. And then with respect to intensity, about two-thirds of the time, we can get within plus or minus one G, G level or one storm level on this, so that outside as well. But again, this is that category of storms that's really a lot tougher for us uh, because it's not headed directly at us. Um, so these storms can, on average, last for you know to 24 to 36 hours. We have seen, as Tom indicated, the strength and the orientation of the magnetic field um, was favorable to drive strong storming. Um, we have seen just recently that magnetic field strength kind of start to decay a little bit and and uh, kind of approach an orientation that's not as favorable for strong storming. So we are, should see levels uh, taper off in the near term. However, uh, we can't tell you exactly how this is going to play out. And, you know, it could, could further re-enhancement could happen as well. Um, so with respect to uh, uh, continued activity from this, the uh, responsible region is in decay somewhat. Um, it is approaching what we call the limb, or if you're looking at the sun, the far right edge. So once it, it rotates out of view, it's, any eruptions originating from it really aren't in a good position to affect us anymore. So this should be kind of the last of the, the kind of round of significant activity we should see from this. Uh, so once we get through this, this uh, round of storming, uh, that will be all that should be expected from this region uh, at this time. So on average, we, I think at this point in, in the last solar cycle, we had seen roughly 45 periods of storming of this intensity. So while this is certainly, um, you know, severe storming, and, and as, as Tom described, it's not unusual. It is a little bit unusual, this solar cycle, because of the depressed activity. But in the big scheme of things, looking from a longer-term uh, point of view, uh, certainly not uh, spectacular by any stretch. Um, so that uh, concludes my portion of the briefing. I'll turn it over to Brent. Thank you, Bob. Uh, this is Brent Gordon. I uh, just want to uh, quickly touch on some of the uh, impacts that have been reported back to the Space Weather Prediction Center thus far. Um, no, as uh, Dr. Berger mentioned early on, we have heard no reports of uh, any uh, major outages or fluctuations on, on the power grid, the nation's power grid. Uh, but we have heard uh, several, uh, several sightings of uh, a very vivid aurora uh, before the sun uh, rose today. Uh, aurora sightings were um, uh, mainly uh, confined to the northern tier of the United States, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, both North and South Dakota, as well as Washington State. We all heard of uh, observations from there, and of course, uh, Alaska as well. Um, as the storm continues, um, we expect uh, northern Europe uh, to have a very good aurora sightings uh, through the evening. Uh, as Bob mentioned, uh, the, the ending time of this is currently an uncertainty. If it continues uh, well into the evening tonight, 
uh, you could uh, have a, a very strong possibility of seeing continued aurora sightings over uh, the northern U.S., uh, perhaps even as uh, far south as uh, the, the middle part of the United States. Um, so that's all we have at this point in time. It's fairly early in the game uh, as far as getting reports in, uh, but that's all we have at this point in time for uh, impacts. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Susan. Okay, thanks. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to Bob Rutledge for one second. Yeah, so just to, to highlight something related for those of you that followed the uh, Discover launch, the Deep Space, Deep Space Climate Observatory um, last month. So the, uh, that's a replacement for the ACE spacecraft, for those of you that are familiar with that. So as I said, we can see these eruptions from the sun. Uh, we get to model them when they'll get here. And then we do have an upstream buoy to kind of get better certainty and, and to really drive our short-term higher confidence warning products, which is exactly uh, what played out this morning. So um, that's why this is important, and that's why that spacecraft was launched. Because the uncertainty we live with when we just observe the, the storms at the sun, we have to measure and, and model that just upstream of Earth. So that's part of the, the uh, uncertainty that we live with. So ACE is still performing those duties. The, uh, the NASA ACE spacecraft, a good partnership between NOAA and NASA, and Discover gets a million-mile trip to that point upstream of Earth, so it is on its way and is expected to take over those operations later this year, maybe late this summer. So that, that spacecraft is performing well, still in checkout, but it kind of reinforces the point of why it's important to make that, that, that measurement. So that's okay. all I have. Great. Thanks, Bob. All right, Angie, we'll uh, open it up to questions now. Thank you. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Make sure your line is unmuted and record your name at the prompting. One moment. Our first question comes from Seth Morenstein. Please state your affiliation and go ahead with your question. Yes, thank you. It's Seth Morenstein of the Associated Press. I guess this is more for Tom, but if anyone wants to answer it, uh, it would be great. Um, I know this has been a very slow uh, peak cycle, and you mentioned this is only the uh, second G4 this cycle. Can you tell us when the last G4 was, when the last G5 was, um, and then also... Did the fact that these combined um, cause, is that one of the reasons why this is stronger than expected, um, that, you know, that they combined on Earth? And finally, I just want to make sure I heard right. You're saying you're not expecting any satellite issues here, right, even though you often see satellite issues with G4. Not often, but you can see. Okay. That's, that's correct, Seth. I'll, I'll answer your questions in reverse order there. Uh, we are not experiencing a radiation storm uh, currently uh, with this G4 storm. That is a little bit unusual. As Bob mentioned, there was a, an uptick in the radiation levels just following the eruptions from the sun. Uh, but normally when we uh, receive a shock of this magnitude at the Earth with the arrival of the CME, we expect to see the proton and electron levels uh, sort of pushed ahead of that shock also come up. In this case, we did not see that, um, so uh, we are currently below threshold levels for radiation in Earth's orbit, uh, and, and, and therefore there's no threat to satellites and there's no threat to aviation, uh, polar route aviation, for instance, because the radiation will not be penetrating down into the atmosphere to any levels. Um, in regard to the combination of CMEs causing this, that's a theory. We really, our, our model did show that the two eruptions that occurred on the sun early on the 15th uh, one was a filament eruption with a very low-level flare associated. One was a larger flare from the sunspot region that Bob mentioned. That was a C9 flare on uh, March 15th at around 2.30 UT, 2.30 in the morning. It looked to, in our models, like the two CMEs from those events combined um, and then uh, arrived at Earth today, as Bob mentioned, earlier than expected. Uh, but it is just a theory that the combination would be stronger than either one of them together. We, we think that's a possibility, but uh, it could just be, for instance, that the C9 CME was stronger than it looked, and it's driving most of the activity here. But, uh, again, that's, that's currently uh, an active area of research that uh, NASA is involved in, trying to figure out you know, exactly how CMEs propagate, whether or not when they combine, their magnetic fields combine in ways that are more geo-effective or not. Uh, so at this time, uh, we're just saying that's a theory as to why this storm was significantly stronger than, we, than expected. And uh, as to your last question, when was the last G4 and G5, I can't answer that off the top of my head. Uh, perhaps, uh, Bob, uh, 
Yeah, Tom, I do. I have the, the material in front of me. So it was in, I believe, August of 2005, was the last period, and then um, several several um, occurrences of that in 2004, and then we, we go back to the very strong Halloween storms of October and November of 2000, October of 2003, and then a following geomagnetic storm in November of that year as well. So it has been, you know, essentially a decade uh, since we've seen G5 conditions. What about G4? So G4, as Tom said, a couple of occurrences. Uh, that the last one I have here is in late 2013, and I believe that is October, but I would have to verify that date. So fall of 2013 is the last one I show, and I do have those papers in front of me here. So a year and a half, something this strong. Right. Yeah, and, and just an, another kind of clarification here. So those are pretty much isolated periods, so hard to tell now what we'll get. We may just get one period of that. Um, sometimes some of the more remarkable storms have sustained, um, you know, periods that where you see this sustained for six, eight, ten hours even. But so far, just one period of that. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Jacobson, please state your affiliation, and you may ask your question. I'm with the, thank you so much, I'm with the PBS NewsHour. Um, I was wondering if you could just walk, uh, walk us through, uh, in basic terms, what, uh, what, this, what this CME does uh, to the Earth as it, comes, as it comes into our atmosphere. Uh, why isn't this hitting us uh, head-on? Why isn't it ca causing uh, radiation storms? And why is that so unusual? Yeah, I'll take that question. The, um, the, 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 the exact effect of a CME is due to the magnetic field in the CME. So the sun has just thrown off a large cloud of magnetic field. And uh, we call those coronal mass ejections because it also throws off a, a significant amount of mass in the form of plasma, electrons and protons, associated with that CME. So a large magnetic cloud has been expelled from the, from the sun. In this case, two of them, as I mentioned. Uh, but that they seem to have combined into one. Uh, this, the directionality of those, uh, as you can imagine, is variable. And the Earth relative to the sun is, is A, as Bob mentioned, 93 million miles away, and B, a very, very small target. So even though this magnetic cloud from the sun is very large, it gets thrown off into space in, in a random direction. In this case, uh, that direction was, in our models at least, mostly away from the Earth, with the Earth just catching the edge, getting that glancing blow, that Bob mentioned, of the magnetic cloud. And that's, again, why we were thinking this was not going to be a severe magnetic storm. Our models showed that uh, we were just going to receive a glancing blow from this magnetic cloud coming off of the sun. Now, what happens, and, and we may have, uh, according to the strength of the storm, we're now thinking that we caught a, a bit more than just a glancing blow, obviously. Now, what happens when that magnetic cloud arrives at Earth, that magnetic field of the, of the cloud from the sun interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, and if the signs of those magnetic fields are roughly opposite, just like with magnets that are opposite polarity, you get a lot more attraction, a lot more interaction between the cloud and the Earth's magnetic field. And in this case, we did see that. The cloud's magnetic field was sort of oppositely directed from the Earth's magnetic field, and the interaction between the two fields was very, very strong. And what that does is when you have magnetic fields interacting and changing, they drive electric currents. So very, very strong electric currents get driven very high up in the Earth's atmosphere, in what we call the ionosphere, where there's ionized gas. Electrons and protons are free, so they can drive very strong currents. These changing magnetic fields, due to the interactions of the sun's cloud with the Earth's magnetic field, drive tremendously large currents up in the ionosphere. And these currents are then echoed on the ground, actually. So we see ground-level currents in the Earth itself and those are the things that can be picked up by power stations, which, of course, have very, very deep spikes in the ground to ground the electrical grid. And those currents in the ground can be picked up by the electrical grid, for instance, and propagated into the grid and cause upsets of the grid. So that's sort of the basic physics of what's happening. You have two magnetic fields interacting in an interplanetary sense, but they drive electrical currents because we have an atmosphere and we have a conductive Earth that we live on. And that's what causes the main space weather effects that we see in a geomagnetic storm. And then the last piece, the radiation you mentioned. Again, I, as I mentioned earlier, normally when you have that large magnetic cloud coming out from the sky, you expect it to be pushing ahead of it a lot of protons and electrons, accelerating those up to high energies, which then will come uh, basically collide with the Earth and penetrate into the atmosphere. 
but in this case, uh, we did not see that. And again, this is a current area of very active research at NASA and the NSF to try and understand exactly why some CMEs do show radiation enhancements and some don't. It's not always the case that uh, large CMEs show radiation enhan enhancements, and this is one of those. So ongoing research by NASA and NSF will hopefully answer it, this question for us soon, and we'll be able to better predict uh, whether or not we can see radiation enhancements with each solar eruption that we, that we witness. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thank you. Miriam Kramer, please state your affiliation, and you may ask your question. Hi, uh, Miriam Kramer with Space.com. Um, thanks for doing this. Uh, I, I'm just curious, are, are there any other uh, active areas of the sun that, that you're potentially looking out for uh, at the moment, anything maybe rotating it to view? Um, and that, that's it. Thanks. I'll pass that one off to Bob. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. So essentially the, the short answer is no. So we have had... Um, a pretty quiet sun lately, although it has had you know, some periods of enhancement. But at the time, the only really notable region on the sun is this one. And as I said earlier, it's, it's rotating out of view. So we, we um, can infer what's happening on the back side, both from some research spacecraft, um, the stereo spacecraft. One of those is, is currently functioning, although behind the sun, so we're not getting much from that. Uh, we can also watch, as we talked about, these corona, coronagraphs and the, the eruptions, we can see when there's a very, very large active region on the back of the sun, we can sometimes see the eruptions associated with that. And we see really nothing, nothing of that uh, right now. So we don't um, have anything that we expect to be rotating in view, and there's nothing significant on the back side that we're aware of. So this really is really the only region of interest, and it is uh, kind of, again, rotating out of view. So this should be, should be it with respect to this sequence of events. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Angela Fritz. Please state your affiliation. You may ask your question. Hi. Thanks for doing this. Angela Fritz, Washington Post, Capital Weather Gang. Um, two questions. The first is, um, how confident are you that we're kind of on the downward slope of this, this current storm, um, given previous uncertainties in the storm? And then my second question is for Brent. I think you mentioned that we could see aurora as far south as the middle part of the U.S., and I just wanted to confirm that and what um, K-index you were predicting with that, if it is the middle of the U.S. Thanks. Bob, you want to handle the uh, certainty question? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a great deal of uncertainty. I think in general when you see the kind of the strength of a storm, um, we've seen, I think, what this is capable of, um, but I can't tell you that with, with absolute certainty. So every time I look down at my phone and the – the graph of the, the strength of the strength and orientation of the field, um, I couldn't tell you what that next data point is going to be. And so, uh, but persistence or what's happening now is, a, is as good a prediction of what's going to happen in the near future as any. And so, based on my experience and what, what the, how these usually play out, I would say we have the potential for storming of similar intensity over the next 12 hours. And in general, after that time, we begin to see some decay. But we could see lingering effects of this even for the next 24 to 36. Uh, but more of the same likely in the near term, although I, I don't see indication that that's stronger is likely at this point. Hey, Angela, this is Brent following up on that. Um, the, the middle of the U.S. Um, uh, statement was assuming that we would continue in the G4 uh, category, or K of 8 uh, category, as, uh, as Bob mentioned, for the next 12 hours. Um, given um, past um, evidence, uh, our past sightings at that level, uh, we have seen reports as far south as Tennessee, New Mexico, Oklahoma uh, in the past. Of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of factors uh, go into whether or not you can see, if you can see the aurora or not, uh, certainly cloud cover uh, being the most important in, in proximity to uh, city lights. Uh, we are uh, a little bit uh, favorable, uh, in a favorable position as far as the moon is concerned, uh, this, uh, this go around, the moon uh, being uh, uh, fairly uh, crescent, um, will give us uh, some pretty dark skies for a long period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Keith Matheny, please state your affiliation. You may ask your question. Yes, I'm with the Detroit Free Press. Uh, one of the ways that uh, the general public uh, usually uh, manifests these sorts of storms is in disruption of their televisions. I'm wondering if they're going to see any sort of pixelation of their pictures or anything like that with this storm. Uh, and then 
getting back to the Aurora, would you suspect that Michigan is a likely candidate to have a good show, a good light show this evening? Yeah, I'll take the first part of that question, um, namely that uh, television shouldn't be affected by this geomagnetic storm. We typically don't see uh, effects on television reception during a geomagnetic storm unless there's a very, very large power disruption, of course. That's not expected with this storm either. Um, this storm is severe enough, however, and mentioned these currents in the ionosphere could be strong enough to somewhat disrupt uh, GPS reception. Uh, GPS is a satellite-based location and timing system, uh, so when you use Google Maps on your phone, for instance, you're relying on looking at a satellite through the Earth's atmosphere and ionosphere. And if the ionosphere is disturbed by these large-scale currents generated by the geomagnetic storming, uh, your GPS reception could be affected uh, at this G4 level, um, we would expect to see fluctuations, for instance, in reception quality and also accuracy of the GPS uh, lock that you get on your position. So people might actually notice something in, in terms of not being able to uh, get uh, GPS locations as accurately or as quickly as they normally do. We haven't had any reports of that yet, but again, this is an ongoing storm, and we will be collecting impact uh, data after the storm to see exactly what did happen. But again, in terms of television reception, I wouldn't expect any uh, problems, but you might notice some effects on your GPS equipment. Also, if you're a ham radio operator and you rely on the ionosphere to bounce your radio signals around the Earth, uh, you will likely see some disruption of that due to the ionospheric uh, disturbances we're experiencing right now with the storm. And uh, to follow up on your question, uh, with the, the aurora over Michigan, certainly uh, if this storm continues uh, into the, um, the the nighttime hours over the U.S., uh, Michigan is uh, certainly going to be in a prime location to uh, see this, given the intensity that we've seen so far. Okay, and who were the two people speaking there, I'm sorry? Uh, that was Tom Berger to begin with, and Brent Gordon following. All right, thank you. I would, I would like to take the opportunity to highlight a product that the that Swipsy does have. And on the front page of our uh, website is the Ovation Auroral product. So because of the uncertainty in this business, because we can't tell you what's going to be happening at 10 o'clock tonight when someone may want to step outside, that product takes the data from that upstream solar wind monitor, the ACE spacecraft, and to become Discover, and gives that short-term prediction of the aurora. And it's really shown it's really tangible for people. It shows both the probability of being able to view that, and then there's also a red line on there that says, um, you know, where should you be able to see it from? So even though because it's high in the sky, you can see it, you know, up to several hundred, up to a thousand kilometers south of where it may truly be overhead. So I would recommend that just so we don't have people disappointed that step outside. Is there's the chance tonight if this persists, and that short-term uh, prediction in order should be very valuable to save people from stepping outside if they don't need to. That's uh, spaceweather.gov. Thank you. Seth Bornstein, please state your affiliation. You may ask your question. Yes, it's Seth at AP again. Just, Tom, just I want to clarify one thing. Um, the satellite effects I was asking about, were, um, in, uh, I know radiation is one thing, but don't you, don't the geomagnetic uh, effects have, an, uh, isn't there a geo, geomagnetic effect on operations, electrical parts of the satellite and on drag, which we still expect that? Oh, yeah, that's a very good point, Seth. Um, the, again, the radiation effects are what you worry about for spacecraft charging and electrical effects. Um, those are typically due to the spacecraft collecting the protons and the electrons that are coming uh, in front of the storm. And, again, we don't see that for this storm. So we're not, a, we're not expecting electrical effects uh, on the spacecraft, electrical charging or single-event upsets in the electronics due to those deeper penetrating protons, for instance. Uh, However, satellite drag is dependent on the ionospheric density, uh, so the orbits of satellites, uh, low Earth orbiting satellites, uh, for instance, in particular, are going through the ionosphere as they go around the Earth. And if, if the ionosphere is enhanced in density, those satellites will experience drag on their orbits and decay of their orbits, requiring the operators to correct their orbits using thruster firings. Um, at this time, we don't have any real-time way of monitoring uh, the density of the ionosphere or satellite drag. We haven't heard anything from the satellite operators that they are having to make corrections to orbits, but we would expect perhaps some increase in ionospheric density associated with this event. So there could be some notable, uh, noticeable satellite drag effects 
Again, we'll be doing a uh, post-mortem on this event and contacting satellite operators to see if they did these corrections and, 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 and therefore felt the impact of the geomagnetic storm. Seth, this is Bob Relish. Just one more comment just to build on what Tom said. Um, so the, the other thing that can happen here, and sometimes it's walking the line between being absolutely right and overwhelming you with the details of the processes and then, you know, giving you enough information. So there are probably four different ways that you can affect satellites, and you're exactly right. Um, the one thing we haven't really covered and we don't know right now is how will the trapped radiation belts around the Earth respond. So um, we'll watch over the coming days and issue products for the geosynchronous um, electrons, essentially that can cause some of the problems that Tom talked about. So there is there is going to be a delayed response to some of this as well. And uh, as you well know and probably remember, uh, it's things like that that can contribute to later losses of satellites. And the Galaxy 15 uh, is a good example of that from where the results of the reorganization of the radiation belts ultimately cause spacecraft anomalies. So again, you can have the immediate impact from, from kind of what's going on now. And then as the radiation belts around Earth, the trapped radiation reorganizes itself, that can also contribute to problems that uh, tend to show up slightly later than the initial initial enhancement. Thank you. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Currently, I'm showing no other questions in the queue. We'll give it a few moments. Okay, we'll, um, we'll conclude the call there. Again, if you have um, further questions or need more information, feel free to call uh, National Weather Service NOAA Public Affairs, 301-427-9000. And um, Angie, if you could put us in a post-conference, I'd appreciate it. Okay, one moment, please. That does conclude today's conference. You may now disconnect from the audio portion.